Okay, so this will be the uh, second lecture this week. I was going to continue talking more about the properties of ordinals that we're defining, and I'll talk about the recursion theorem, although I think I'm going to leave the proof of that until next time. So do pop up with any queries you have about this, uh, about this material. So I'm talking about now on talking to page 32 in the notes. I'll just uh, refresh our memories a little bit about uh, stuff that we talked about last time. So there we talked about um, adding one order, one order to another or multiplying, looking at product of orders. And we saw how we were going to look at pictures of ordinals, how you could take an ordinal alpha and then after it, put a copy of the ordinal beta, or at least from your way around, this way around. We'd have alpha followed by a copy of an ordinal beta, and we're going to call this roughly alpha plus beta. And we're going to give this a proper definition after we've proven this recursion theorem. But we had defined for sets of ordinals something like a soup of the ordinals. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about sets of ordinals and their suprema. So let's uh, review that to an extent. Then Sorry, I better use the <coughs> black pen. So if A is a set of ordinals, then sub A, we define this to be is the least ordinal psi such that for every alpha in A, alpha is less than or equal to psi. And this had the effect that omega, if we think about omega, the supremum of omega is actually omega itself. Because after all, what is omega? It's the collection of all of the smaller things. So it's the least transitive set well ordered by epsilon that contains all the naturals. So it's an ordinal and it's also a set of ordinals. So as a set, its supremum is itself. But if I take something like three, which is just zero, one and two here, Supremum of three, okay, the least ordinal greater than or equal to everything in three. Well, actually that's two, right? Perhaps slightly perversely, but the supremum of a successor ordinal is just the predecessor that's there. But of course, something like the supremum of, if I take the set of evens, of course, this is just Omega as well. I think I'm just going to look for a um, a better pen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Many texts would just define the supremum of A to be the union of A. But, okay, I've defined it slightly differently, so this becomes a lemma. 324. If 
for a set of ordinals A. So th there is one thing to remark. I do say set of ordinals here. I can only make this definition <coughs> for a set of ordinals. A might be, if A was a class of all ordinals, then the supremum wouldn't be defined. So we first remark that <clears throat> sup A is properly defined after all. There is an ordinal which is an upper bound for A. Suppose there wasn't. Then that would mean for every ordinal gamma, there'd be a delta in A that was bigger than it. There'd be some delta in A where gamma is less than delta. So if, the, if no gamma is an upper bound, for every gamma, there's going to be a larger thing in A here. So then we, then we appeal to the axiom of union and say that the union of A here is a set because A is a set. But actually then, UA is on. Sorry, but, but sorry, but UA is the same as ON, the class of all ordinals, because every ordinal is a member of something in A. So the collection of members of members of A is all ordinals. So it can't be a set by Birali 40. Sorry, it can't be ON by Borali 40. So this is a contradiction. Sorry, we've arrived at a contradiction. So we conclude that there is an upper bound for A and sup A is just the least upper bound. Okay, so we're justified in defining sup A for sets A like this. And now the, the, the body of the lemma we've yet to do, yet to really address, we want sup A to be big union of A. Okay, so Let gamma be sup A, which we now know exists. And we let delta be big union of A, which exists by the fact A is a set and the axiom of union. Okay, so let eta be in big union, sorry, let eta be in a big union of A. So what does it mean to be in a big union? You are a member of a member of something. So for some tor in A, eta is a member of tor. So what this is going to then mean is that, okay, I, I pick anything in this big union here. Then for some tor in A, eta is less than this tor. 
But the supremum of A is greater than or equal to everything that's in A. So I've got that this gamma is greater than or equal to tau, which is greater than eta. So what have I got? I've shown then that <clears throat> everything here that's in the union of A here is less than gamma. Which I can write like that. Big union of A is all contained in gamma. So now I argue the other way around. So this delta here is contained in gamma. And now I'm going to argue that gamma is contained in delta. Conversely, suppose eta here is in gamma. Then, okay, what I'm saying is then an eta is less than sub A, because gamma is sub A, and epsilon is less than. So if eta is less than sub A, right, it means that there is something in A, right, in, because eta is not the sub of A, it means there's something in A which is bigger than it. So there is some mu in A. <clears throat> with eta is less than mu. Right, and then mu again is less than or equal to sub A. But that's all I need. I've got my eta, which is in gamma. I've got that actually it's a member of mu which is either a member of sub A or is sub A. So in either way, eta is a member of sub A. So I've got the reverse inclusion here. Anything in gamma is in sub A, which I call delta. So that completes that limit. Excuse me? Yes. Uh, how can we be sure that such mu exists? That such which exists? Such mu, uh, mu such that y mu. Uh, smaller than, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, let me, let me just write down what I want to conclude here and we'll come back to you. So, so we have that gamma is contained in delta, hence gamma equals delta, and that should be the finish. <laughs> unless I've made a mistake. So why should there be such a mu? Um, <clears throat> suppose eta is um, less than gamma here. Um, so eta is less than sub A. This is the least ordinal, um, Oh, I think I've tacitly assumed A doesn't have a largest ordinal. Um, um, thank you, thank you. I think uh, this is, I think this looks like a mistake. I think I've assumed that A doesn't have a largest ordinal. And that's why I've written down, written this here. Um, okay, let me deal, let me deal with that. Um, just check. Uh, 
yes, that, that is indeed what I've been, been assuming. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> How should we do this? Uh, so maybe I should say something like, okay, case one. A has no largest, has no greatest element. So then all of this is fine here. Um, and this, so there is like this, the mu that you're asking about is indeed because mu A has no greatest element. So given any eta less than sup A, there is a mu bigger than eta, right? Which is going to be, <clears throat> Um, so I don't, I don't want to make this too complicated and I'm, no, no, let, let's not do this, it's making it too complicated. Um, okay, let me, let me cross this bit out. Sorry, oh, making a mess of this. <clears throat> okay, let, let me let me start again for the converse part. Conversely, suppose here's sub A. I want to show this reverse inclusion here. Suppose I've got something in here. This is sup A. Um, so let's say case one. Suppose gamma is the largest element of A. Right, so a picture of A then would have, here's A and here would be its largest element, gamma, if we're in that case. Uh, so then, then I would say, right, um, Okay, if eta is a member of gamma, then it means that eta is down below here. So eta is less than gamma. So in that case, right, what I've got is that, uh, so it's the largest element of, so the largest element of A. So I have eta here is less than gamma. But now what is big union? It's the collection of members of members of A. So actually the big union of A contains gamma. Because okay. big union of A contains all the members of members of A. Here's a member of A. So all of the these elements of gamma are in the big union of A. So eta is in the big union of A. So eta is an arbitrary element of gamma, so gamma is a subset of the big union of A. And then if A has no largest element, it's just like the, the bit that I've crossed out. 
gamma is not in A because A has no largest element. So the picture of A then would be, it's just an increasing set, but gamma, its supremum is not in there. Okay, so now if I take uh, an eta in gamma, eta is less than the supremum of A, okay, which is this gamma here. So now I know there are things in A bigger than eta, so I could pick a mu here. mu in A with eta less than mu. Okay, here, which is less than gamma. So eta is a member of mu, which is a member of gamma. So eta is a member of sub A. Okay, so again, we take, <coughs> um, Uh, sorry, what have I done? I've, I'm trying to show that gamma is contained in delta. So I want to show that um, here we have, right? This is an element of an element of A. So I should be saying here. because eta is an element here of an element of A, so it's in here. Hence, I have the other inclusion. And they're the same. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. That seems to have saved me from a mistake. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, we think of ordinals as coming in three different flavors, right? So there's a very special flavor of zero, right, which is the unique first ordinal with no predecessors. There are successor ordinals, which will write suck A for successor, sorry, alpha. And that's because alpha is the successor of something, right? So we're gonna write alpha is beta plus one. So, a successor ordinal is something which has an immediate predecessor, like the naturals do. So here we're going to have things like omega plus 23, right? 17, anything plus something, alpha beta plus one. So these are the successor ordinals. And then there are going to be limit ordinals. So these are the things that occur like omega. It's the union of its predecessors, right? but it doesn't have an immediate predecessor. And these are all the rest down here. So this means it's an ordinal, but it's not of the other two flavors. It's not zero and it's not a successor. And here we're going to have something like omega, but then we're going to be doing looking at things we looked at before, pictures of omega plus omega, right? This is going to be a copy of omega followed by another copy of omega. And so this again will be a limit ordinal. 
We'll say it's a transitive set well ordered by epsilon, but it has no largest element. And there'll be plenty of these as well. We're going to be looking at things like omega squared and so on. So I'll write suck and lim down here um, quite often, right, for talking about limit and successor ordinals. So we've got these three types. And often in arguments, we have to distinguish whether we're talking about successor and limits. For example, if we're going to do proofs by induction on ordinals, we're now going to have a separate extra case to deal with. For natural numbers, we said, oh, something is true for a base case. And if it's true for n, it's true for n plus 1. So we deal with successors like that. But now to prove something or by induction or define something by recursion on ordinals, we're going to have to do things for a base case 0, show what happens at successor stages, and then say, OK, I've got everything defined all through these successors. What happens at the next limit? So there's going to be an extra clause there in our definitions and in our proofs. And this is a feature of um, transfinite recursions like this, things where we go beyond the finite, as the name suggests. Okay, so let's think a little bit about a little bit more about this. <clears throat> let's look at exercise three thirteen. So it said compute sup of this set beta plus one and verify that it equals here um, big union of beta plus one. So of course this was just the last lemma. The supremum of a set of ordinals is its big union and beta plus one is a set of ordinals. It's the set of ordinals less than beta plus one, i.e. beta plus one is everything up to beta. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is clearly the least ordinal greater than or equal to everything in the set. Right. By definition of sup. So that computes this here. And really direct verification gives us big union of this set is this. Big union of beta plus one is just beta. So there's perhaps one or two more details to put in there in this last bit, but these are elementary things here. OK, let me just say it. Right. Suppose alpha is in big union of beta plus 1, then <coughs> alpha is a member of some tor, where tor is itself a member of beta plus 1. So Tor is less than or equal to beta. Because beta is the largest thing inside beta plus 1 down here. So I've got that this set is contained in this set. But now if I pick an alpha that's in beta here, yeah. 
then as beta is a member of beta plus one, alpha is a member of big union of beta plus one. You see, the ordinals, <clears throat> I can think of them, you know, as just points in an ordering, but they're also sets. So I can do the ordinary set operations on them, like big union. And we use this special feature of ordinals that an ordinal is the set of its predecessors. So now I've got anything that's in beta is in here. So I've got this reverse inclusion as sets. So they're the same. So beta, which we said was super beta plus one, is big union of beta plus one. Perhaps should be a little careful here, at least at the beginning, to put brackets around just to make sure oh, we know what we're taking big unions over. Then part two of the exercise, which I left as homework, right, was to show, let's say lambda is a limit ordinal. This is equivalent to saying that it's the big union of itself. Well, we've already said that big union is the same as sup, so this Equivalence doesn't add anything new, right? Because we've already shown by the lemma that this equals this. So the point is just to think about limit ordinals and just see that they are, again, they are their own union. Right? It's here. Okay, any questions? Any unpornographic questions? Okay. So what we're going to think about next is this recursion theorem that's coming up, theorem 335. Uh, I said I'll use the proof, I'll do the proof next time. But let's discuss what's happening. So this is some kind, sometimes called transfinite recursion. Transfinite recursion theorem on the ordinals. Okay, so this is first formulated by um, Hungarian mathematician von Neumann, uh, very eminent 20th century, early 20th century mathematician. And it has features common to the recursion theorem that we did for arithmetic, the recursion theorem on on omega, on little omega. So here we've got the next function, as it were, is now we do this in great generality. I just suppose I've got a function from sets to sets. So we let this be any function. And this will be very economically stated. Then there exists a unique function h from ordinals to sets so that for any ordinal alpha h of alpha is f of h restricted to alpha So let's just comment on what this is saying here. <clears throat> now remember, this is a restriction operator on functions. So what this is, is the function or relation H restricted to that part of its domain that's in alpha. Right? So it's a piece of the whole function H. It's just we take the domain of H and we intersect it with alpha to get the domain of H restricted to alpha. 
So see how this is going to work, right? This is supposed to work for all ordinals. So we have three flavors of ordinals, zero successors and limits. So what happens when, when alpha equals omega, uh, alpha is zero, the first ordinal? What does it say? It says that h of zero is f of h restricted to zero. What does this mean? This is a function whose domain is zero. Well, zero is the empty set. So actually, this is just the empty function. Right? It's a function where there's nothing in its domain. Right? So it doesn't return me any value. So as a set of ordered pairs, this is the empty set. But that's all right. F has domain all of V. So the empty set is an element of the domain of F. So actually, this is a, a neat way of getting a starting value. So this is just some starting set. Um, choose some doesn't matter, choose some letter, um, W. So it's just some starting set. So it looks a bit too much like omega, let's call it uh, V. No, let's call it U. Okay. And what will H of one be? H of one will be F of H restricted to one. So again, recall that one is just this here. <clears throat> now I've got H restricted to one already because I defined what happened at zero, which is the only element of one. H of zero was U. So H restricted to one is a function who's only got one ordered pair in it. It's the zero, and then f of zero, which is u. So that is h of one. Right? And h, sorry, h restricted to one. And h of one is f of this gadget. Again, f is defined on all ordered pairs. It's defined on all of v. Right? So h of one is f of this. is f of this set. Which is whatever it is. Right? Let's call it u1. Let's call this u0. So I'm just going through how the mechanics of the, the recursion works. So similarly, what is h of two is going to be, this is going to be f of h restricted to two. So actually this is going to be, when you work it out, it's f of, now there are only going to be two ordered pairs in here, u zero u zero and one u one. And that's whatever it is, u two, so. So that's how the that's how the clauses play out in these successor cases. But now we've got the third flavor of ordinal to deal with. Once I've gone through the finites, I'm going to have to get decide what omega is going to be. Well, that's all right. It's just defined by this clause. H of omega will be f of h restricted to omega which is actually f of this set here with all of these. And now this function is an infinite function. Its domain is omega and there's an infinitely many ordered pairs go in to make up this function. And h of omega is declared to be f of this set here. So we could call this u omega. So actually the, 
one clause that's written out in here, in a sense, sort of disguises the fact that things happen by cases when something is zero, when something is a successor, or when something is a limit. And what I've done here for these finites, one and two and so on, and for this first limit ordinal, omega, this is going to approach typical of what happens at later successors and later limits. Yeah. So that's how it's going to work. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Oh, I don't understand what f of an ordered pair is. Uh, okay. Um, I don't, I'm not obliged to say very much about it because part of the data of the situation is that I've got a function that acts on any sets. So F can act on this set here. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah, is it all right? It, yeah. Uh, I thought V was a set, but no, V is the universe of all sets. V is the universe of all sets, yes. Yeah, okay. There I got it. Okay. Thank you. Good. Good. So what we have, in fact, sort of hidden and packed nicely into this definition <clears throat> is something, sort of a definition by cases, depending on the flavor of the ordinal. And Often, if you look in a textbook, you will see, as on page 34, recursion written out as in theorem 338. So let's just look at that here. So again, recursion, transfinite recursion theorem on the ordinals and let's call it the second form. Right? So this perhaps looks a little bit more like the recursion on little omega. We pick a starting value, starting set, again v, little u0 and v, and now I suppose I've got two functions going from v to v. And the conclusion is, so then there's a unique H again going from ordinals to V and it corresponds to those flavors. H of zero is defined to be the starting function. H of the successor of something here is defined to, then we use the function F zero for that. And F zero, now this just depends just on the last value. We didn't have to consider all of the previous values. I and mean, we could have done, we could have taken that into case, into account. And we do that when we come to limits, if alpha is a limit ordinal, like omega, then h of alpha is, and then we deploy the other function. And we look at all of the values so far up to alpha. So that's putting the three, making the three clauses quite explicit. <clears throat> And you can convert this form <clears throat> into a recursion that looks like the main form above. Easy enough. I just make one function up out of this data here. Define f from v to v and use just use theorem 337.
and I just define this by cases. I just, I need a function from V to V and it'll incorporate U0 and F0, F1. I'll say F of X is U0, if X is zero. On the other hand, F of U will be F0 of U. If I've got a function here, and its domain is a successor ordinal. And otherwise, if it's, if it's a function whose domain is a limit ordinal, I'll deploy the other, I'll use, I'll define fu in terms of f1 and default everything else to the empty set. So now all I've done is just take this initial element and these two other functions, and I've just squeezed them all together into one ball of a function f here. So now I can just deploy the, the previous theorem. So this is often said to be a definition, recursion by definition by cases. All right. When we have these different cases like this. Okay, are there any, any questions there? Okay, again, we'll come, well, we'll come back to that proof of that theorem, but, and also these applications. What we're going to do is define arithmetic. So we're going to do ordinal addition. So we're going to have, instead of just add n, there's going to be an add alpha function. We're going to say that alpha plus zero is just alpha. Alpha plus beta plus one, I'm going to write this as this. I'm going to assume I've already defined what alpha plus beta is, and then I'm going to take the successor of that. So this will just be alpha plus beta plus one. Now, so far, nothing is different from finite addition if I was using the natural numbers in place of alpha. But we have this third flavor of ordinal. I have to say what happens at limits. So if lambda is a limit ordinal, then I'm going to define what it means to add, sorry, add alpha to lambda here. I'm just going to take the supremum of the things that I already had. What I get by adding alpha to psi for psi less than lambda. And this I'm going to call alpha plus lambda. <clears throat> so we define in this th third case here, if alpha is a, la a limit ordinal, sorry, if lambda is a limit ordinal, here might be alpha. I assume I've got alpha plus these things already defined. And then alpha plus lambda will be the supremum of all of these. So that's how addition is going to work. And we'll go over this again next time and also to